Zach, I uh, don't know if you've been following um, markets lately, but I've got some interesting things here to show you real quick before we start off the show. Hey, let's welcome Danny back. You know, I'll I'll just start talking. (laughs) There we go. There he is. He's here. The man himself back in studio. Yeah. He's been traveling. Back live with you in studio, Danny That's Stewart. Right. Yeah, some power ninety five. Been FM. on the road. So uh, look at my screen here. So there's been a lot of money lost in the stock market. Okay, I don't think this is a shock to anybody who follows our work or is alive. So now, but there's been even more money lost in the crypto market, and that's that's really. I mean, the stock market has kind of made the front page. The, the crypto market uh, debacle. Carnage. Yeah, like um, this is uh, the journal today. Uh, is crypto going to crash? Don, is that the definition of crash? And so um, uh, it's crashed. It's, it's crashed. It's, I was okay. going to say, is crypto <laughs> going to crash? I think it already happened. So uh, it already happened. Well, I want to make sure I clear it with the crash meister. <laughs> and so uh, crash alarm for the show. Don, the crash meister. Crash meister. How to avoid the crash? Crash meister Vandenborg. And so. Um, uh, John Oakman here, who is a great follower on Twitter, 25 trillion loss this year in the markets. But this is, look, I'm going to give you, I'm not going to bury the lead. I'm going to show you when I think is a great time to get back in stock. And that's not a level. That's not a feeling. I'm going to show you factually on a chart what, uh, where, it doesn't mean it's going to work out, but uh, where it would be a good time to get into stocks. But I want to show you something here uh, from Michael Saylor. Um, not not of Popeye fame, who was another. Popeye was a sailor, Daniel. Yes. And you'd be better off taking financial advice from Popeye. Maybe maybe his best friend uh, Olive Oil, but not Brutus. And so, um, lady friend, excuse me, lady friend. Brutus Olive Oil. Is dope. Yeah. Brutus. What oh, was Bru- Popeye? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good, Don. I was going to say you had another voice oh, added to the. Yeah. Uh, if only his Pop- repertoire. Yes. If only Popeye could talk to Howard Cosell and Dan Stewart at the same time. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> So Michael Saylor, is, I don't know if anyone's seen this clip, but um, hey, can you pop me up, man? Got it. Thanks, dude. And um, I, you got to hear it. It's only a minute 35. Normally, I wouldn't play something a minute 35 long, but you got to hear it okay. because what, what happens, and I, I play this for balance. Oh, go back to me. Okay. I'm looking good. Wow. Now, I don't want to, no, no, not him, <laughs> what, me. Where can people see you? On the YouTube, screen. of course. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Revere you know, management. I started using a way to jump real quick. Very difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. A way to <laughs> you jump. You actually have to jump, Jim. Well, you have to swing you this way. It. This way to jump rope, my, I, can't figure, I can't remember if it weighs two and a half or five pounds. It's a beast. So this way to jump rope, I, I, go back to me. I, I okay. think I've lost a chin. <laughs> Sorry. I've had a couple chins. You look at Sharp. Yeah, ladies and hell? gentlemen, the president of the Tim Razor fan club. Is <laughs> Tim, Tim, Razor. Tim Razor himself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, this this jump rope thing I've done, like I'll go running five or six miles and it it's okay because I guess I'm I guess subconsciously I'm just like pacing running myself and I'm not like miles. exerting that much energy, even though it's 110 degrees. Mm-hmm. The way to jump rope, I went out there the first time like four, maybe a month or so ago. I was I was out of breath. Oh, it's hard. I was a life alert commercial man. Uh, no, All right, how, how much is the weight of jump rope weigh? Let's, I think it was two to five pounds. Like I can't sand remember. in there, right? No, no, it, it's just heavy nylon cord. Oh, like, it's just like a, it's a ton of cord, oh, right? Gotcha. And you're swinging it, and your wrists get really tired. There's a lot of wrist jokes I could make right now. I'm not going to do it. Mm. No, you're, you're sure aren't. Yeah. No, and um, let me tell you something. It is a workout and a half. Yeah, and for I, sure, big on the arm. When yeah. I was playing the best tennis of my career. I was doing 20,000 jump ropes in about 10 minutes. Just, and when I first started jump, my coach told me to jump rope. What are the chances this turned into a Danny? No, no, no. When I, when I first, <laughs> Hey, when I first started doing it, I, I was all arses and elbows. I mean, I couldn't get arses 15, 20 in a row, but after just a couple of weeks in that leather rope, I could just, it was like a boxer, like Rocky. You could just, you just, if I did a regular footwork, jump rope right I mean, now, it'd be going too fast. I'd, I'd, I'd whack myself in the back of the head. You got to get you. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. This jump rope is a kicker. Anyway, I look good. So let's get back to my screen. So see what I did there, Danny? Yeah. Got, got him all ready. Just a little more know. sucked I'll, in. Yeah, I'll go now, right uh, Michael Saylor is the CEO. Is he the founder, Don, of or uh, Hunter? Is he the founder of uh, MicroStrategy? I, I believe so. I think Not he is. I'm not sure, but I believe so. Yeah, Mr. Mr. CEO, but I don't know. Yeah, if he's the so founder. Michael Saylor, a noted Bitcoin enthusiast. This is a th- this is the clip of the millennium. You ready? 
Yep. Let me just let me pot myself up there. Zach, I don't know what my levels are going to be like. Be ready to rock and Go roll. Oh, I got to refresh it. Hold on. Uh, the, Twitter this, gets the best of the us. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Uh, I hope Elon can fix this. We had it all potted up. <laughs> I think I think he said he was going to fix this. Did yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, it all ends. We right. Go. We'll try it one more time. Oh, just from the beginning. If I told you, I know how it all ends. Right. Once you know how it all ends, that, that the only use of time is how do I buy more Bitcoin? <laughs> but take all your money, buy Bitcoin, then take all your time, figure out how to borrow more money to buy more Bitcoin, then take all your time and figure out what you can sell to buy Bitcoin. And if you absolutely love the thing that you're that you don't want to sell it, go mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin with it. And if you've got a business that you love because your family works for the business that's in your family for 37 years and you can't bear to sell it, mortgage it, finance it, and convert the proceeds into the hardest money on earth, which is Bitcoin. So what I would say is use all your time to acquire Bitcoin, finance entities and weaker currencies to buy Bitcoin, or educate yourself on why this makes sense if you're not sure and then educate everybody around you you know if you're working for a company that's got a hundred million dollars in the treasury you ought to convince the ceo and the board of directors to convert the treasury to bitcoin that's the most creative thing you can do that'd be worth billions to them it's like if you were to say to me mike it's the year 2000 you're in argentina what's the best use of your time the best use of my time is figure out how to get all of my money converted into dollars and get it out of Argentina <clears throat> because I'm going to lose 99.5% of the money if I don't. Nothing else matters. My goodness. Can we talk about wow. this for a second? Now, this is what I want to I want to really be clear here. Uh, this type of thinking um, is applied to a lot of things. It's uh, the exuberant. Right, of, of that moment in time. We're prisoners to we're prisoners of the moment. And that moment uh, that I have circled on your screen, June eighth, twenty twenty one, is Bitcoin's moment, right? He is Bitcoin Jesus. He is absolutely telling you he's proselytizing across the great lands, splitting seas, right? Walking across deserts by Bitcoin, right? The Egyptians had pyramids that could be on mortgage. We got we to gotta refinance those up to the hilt, take the money out, and buy big. Tell all the world. Tell the world, Mortgage man. Mortgage it all. Margin, margin to the hilt. Yep. It's, give like, me, it's like long-term capital. Let's give me blow up Moscow. our funds. Two stone tablets. And all the things <laughs> say on the stone tablets are buy Bitcoin. And so, but this thinking also kind of prevails at the bottom of markets, too. You know, I, 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 it's a little better. So a uh, little, little, little story here. So uh, I, I use uh, direct TV stream, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not a purveyor of most news. Um, but I know when my father-in-law who uh, we support with uh, television, right? Cause he's a good dude. And so, uh, but I can tell when he's uh, watching the streaming cause it's just glued to Fox news. And so I turn on the TV after the kids go to bed and um, up pops um, Laura Ingram. And guess who's on TV? The Schiffmeister. This guy? No. No, not this guy. <laughs> no, Peter, Peter Schiff. Schiff. Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff, who is having... Now, if you know anything about Peter Schiff, God bless him. Um, he has... I mean, when Bitcoin was 70,000, was it ever 70,000, Hunter? Was it like 58? So, somewhere in there. It got up to... Uh, 69 and change. 70. Yep. That's funny. Yep. little 69 and change. Sure. So... Uh, shift come, shift was just taking it right. Bitcoin's a joke. Bitcoin's a joke. Bitcoin's a joke. And now shift is making the rounds, man. Do you remember in '08 everyone who was calling for a dot com implosion and like they missed the whole market move up, but they were calling for a dot com implosion, and and then they made their careers. I, I forget some of the names. Obviously, um, the dude uh, who they made him the big short dude, whoever that fella is. Uh, has Michael, Michael, um, Michael, not Michael Murray. Lewis wrote the story, but, uh, uh, the guy who made the, the call, I forget his name. Murray, 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 Murray. Michael Burry. Oh, Michael not, Murray. not Murray, but Burry, Murray, mm -hmm. Burry with a B. Mm -hmm. So Michael Burry, Kyle Bass here in Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. Then goes on uh Burry, I believe went on to go short Tesla and got his butt handed to him. And so like, you're usually good in your lifetime for one of these ginormous calls shift uh is having his moment right now god and and you know what man good for him 
but he's on the Laura Ingram program. And I'm and he goes, Well, you changed that quick. And I'm like, Yeah, I can't. I don't I don't need to watch this and know where this story is going. It's all gloating. It doesn't help anybody. So then we get the exact opposite, right? So uh, I'm not here to lecture you on cryptos or uh, or whatever your feeling is. But then we get Ron Barron. And Ron Barron's super interesting. This just came out today. We are taping the show. It is Friday, June 17th. We are in the ninth hour, in the 50th minute of the ninth hour of Friday morning Central Time. And let me tell you something. This morning, Ron Barron makes a plea. He pleads, Danny. He, it's, beg is too strong of a word. He implores. He says, uh, screen, Zach, please. This, my friends, is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He literally, I, 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 I saw it pop on my, my phone. I'm like, I'm turning on CNBC. And there is the Becky Quick, the Quick of Becky. And she is saying, Ron Barron is imploring. I don't know if she used the word imploring. You can find the clip yourself probably on the internet. But she is telling people, Ron Barron is making a plea to CNBC viewers, this is a once-in-a-lifetime buying opportunity uh, for a generation. He's equating it to 1982. And, and I want to, he might be right, right? Like maybe he's right. Maybe this is the today. What is the S&P trading at right now? 60, 36.48. Maybe he's right. Yeah, but what if he's wrong? Just, just like, what, what if, what if, well, we don't have to play what if. What if Michael Saylor was wrong? By the way, the mayor of, the mayor of Miami has bought into Bitcoin and is now losing. Big time. Oh, yeah. Oh, he wanted Crypto City. Nobody wants crypto these city. These corporations right now. that loaded up on Bitcoin are no, losing it's not even corporations. City. It's all these oh. crypto projects. Yeah, yeah. They built this. Uh, look, it's pretty deep. It's esoteric, but they've built this like bizarro world uh, financial token ICO parallel universe to regulations in this country. And and now uh, the regulators clearly have the upper hand, where all these companies are going to get regulated to the hilt, if not driven out of business. And I don't know who's, you, you, this story isn't done yet. Like, I, is Bitcoin going to 10, I mean, uh, 10,000, yeah. Probably. Breaks 20, it's going to 10. Big chunks, right? And so um, a lot of people hurting this, and by no means am I making light of it. I don't think any of the light in any of this. What I'm pointing out to you is the hubris and the absurdity in the moment because it's easy to get caught up in it. And I don't tell people, don't get caught in it. Tim, are you telling me you're going to have to miss Bitcoin from 4500 all the way to $69.69? $69,699. That's $69.69. You know what? I'm doing it on the fly. It makes sense to me. I like it when you stare at me like you just don't know where the train's going. Trying to follow that. Just, yeah, right. Clueless. Good. So he knows where the train's going. <laughs> <laughs> where are those rails? And so. Like, like on Yellowstone, we're taking them to the train station. Click it a clack. Oh, is that is that a suit? Is that like is that how they kill people? On That's that show? where they dump the bodies. Oh, Go to really? the train station. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, oh. uh, if you don't watch Yellowstone, yeah. it's, it's I'm missing Yellowstone out. On oh, Paramount so Plus. The, yeah. the hubris that you don't have to miss these moments, and you don't. This this is reverse. Like this is everyone thinks that a, a bullish call in the markets is um, it's saint. It's not fearful. Right, like when someone like when someone comes out and says the market is going down, you're going to get ruined. Uh, we we you know they're fear mongers, right? The world's not that weird, and, and, and but this is the this is the same thing except it's a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing. It's a wolf dressed like Little Red Robin Hood, Riding Hood, well, R- Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, yep, not Robin one. Hood. Robin Hood nah, is that Robin. stock that tanked. It's in the hood, not Little Red. He was pushing Bitcoin, too. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Where are those long-haired, uh, villain-like looking fellas that run Robin Hood? Have they been out, on, out talking to anyone? I think Some of their shareholders? Right now. Vlad Tennis. Get me a, hey, get me, um, get me uh, Loki from um, Loki. Oh, we're, okay, we're really Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing the show here. Yeah. Get me Loki uh-huh. and then Vlad Tenev looking at I swear to God, they're twins. Vlad Tenev. Yeah, and Loki, by the way. Loki. Yeah. Right. 
Loki and Vlad Tenev appear to me to be the same person. All right. Okay, so this is the exact opposite. This is, you're going to miss out. If you don't buy stocks right now, you're going to miss it. It's the same gosh darn thing, people. The, the, this is going to lead into 401k. Trust me. We're let, we're, by the way, where we're headed here is action and then what you can do in 401ks. So let me show you something. Ron Barron's got, um, he's got people now. Whoever, I don't know who listens to Ron Barron. By the way, he was very right on Tesla. Give Ron Barron his due. He was steadfastly right on Tesla. And I don't, really don't know Ron Barron from Adam. But I'm going to put this on a weekly chart, okay? I'm going to put it on SPX. And, and if you're like, well, how? <coughs> what I'm trying to do here is remove, remove the, the fear. The emotion. Of missing out. Like, Ron Barron may be right, but just like Billy Joel said, I may be right, but he may be crazy. But that's the next words. He just might be the lunatic you're looking for. But, Danny, if, if he's wrong, turn out the lights. Don't call me maybe. The party's over. <laughs> <laughs> that, my friends, is what, um, who's the Lipton Ice Tea guy that sang at the Howard Cosell on Monday Night Football? Don Meredith? Yes, right. Dandy Don. Yes, yes, yes. So we got, we got ourselves, my friends, a uh, weekly chart here of SPX. And so let me just point out, and we've done this before. I'm not going to do it all through the chart. But if you're really looking for your edge in the markets and you're looking to develop your process, um, you don't have to fall prey to a Michael Saylor or a Ron Barron. And so this uh, purple line here is simply a five exponential moving average. And when it crosses through the eight, and as Danny would say, hey, that's the slow moving through, the fast moving through the slow, what that's telling, is, telling you is that you have price momentum on your side. Short-term momentum is picking up. Now, some of you are going, price momentum, that's evil. I need to use my intellect, my big brain. I have a PhD. I eat saltines with sardines out of a can. I don't know what highfalutin people do with PhDs and big brains. Clearly. Caviar. Oh, caviar. That's not what I was salt. Not, not no? sardines. Caviar. <laughs> the exact opposite of what I said? Yes. Yes, yes. So Saltines, saltines and, and, and sardines are slumming. You want caviar on the Ritz cracker. Oh, putting on the, the Ritz. Ritz. Oh. oh. Could you put something on a Ritz for me, Zach? It's going to be quite the thumbnail. <laughs> yes, it is. And so maybe some FOMO on a Ritz. And so now. A Ritz with the poop emoji. Oh, look at clicks. Dressed up like caviar. Yeah. I didn't think we said poop emoji. Well, we you can use that word. You can't use the oh, other word. Listen, let's, let's not, hey, let's not let's not push the editing this week. We're doing a clean show here. Yes, we are. We're doing great. So now, everybody who is bullish, listen. You can you can use your big intellectual brain to impress people at cocktail parties, but. We all need, if we're bullish, price momentum on our side. Price momentum isn't market timing. It's not going to be something evil. Price momentum is what you need, but you need a way to see it. You don't need Ron Barron to show you the light and hope to God it works out. Because it didn't work out for Michael Saylor. And Ron Barron could be, could be, no, in this situation, could be no different from Michael Saylor. That's what I think of when I hear Saylor. So that was the Popeye. I, I caught that. Oh, did you? Yeah, Sometimes was Popeye, you, wasn't I it? hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got yeah. it. Yeah. So you need price momentum. And the only way to see price momentum was like, well, prices went up today. No, no, look at a chart. And the five going through the eight is glorious. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It's on a weekly. It's not on a 30 minute chart. It's not for today. It's not for tomorrow. It's for the week. It's not day trading. No. no. But that's what people say when they say price momentum. That was, that, that was the knock against one of the world's greatest investors forever. And it's not a knock. It's not a legitimate knock. But people say, oh, that market timer, Bill O'Neill. You mean billionaire Bill O'Neill? You mean the mo one of the most successful stock traders ever? The one who gave people a system to build upon? You mean that Bill O'Neill? If I gave people a choice, would you rather have your big five-pound intellectual brain, Jerry, the human head weighs? How much does a human head weigh, Don? I only know it because of Jerry Maguire. Seven pounds. Seven it depends pounds? on the human. Oh, there you go. Seven sounds right. Yeah. Sure. Seven, so, seven pounds. If I gave people the choice between using their big intellectual five-pound brain or keeping the money that's in their pockets, you know, you have to lose it. 
well, I had to lose some money to make some money. What if I gave you a choice? Like you didn't have to lose a lot of money to make some money. What if I gave you the opportunity to build a higher base than 99% of all the other stock investors in the free world and China? You would choose to keep your money. And so what I say to people who are putting, if you're listening to the, to the news and you hear these people, don't be fearful. Or when people are fearful, you got to be. When people are fearful. Buy when blood's yeah. running in the street. Listen, you're working with your money. Hence the title of the show. Your money. Not their money. No, you don't have their money. You have your money. And so you need to keep your money. So if you have a platform, a base of whether it's $10 million, a million, a hundred thousand, or a hundred dollars, if you you're going to get caught in the knife fight that is the market, but if we can just get you uh, with a, uh, a skin a scratch, right, and you're and you can build from ninety dollars out of a hundred instead of what everybody else is doing by building from fifty, maybe sixty dollars, compounding over time, you are exponentially ahead of the crowd. I couldn't believe I saw like, dude, you're imploring retail investors to come in. And buy now? Like may, maybe he's right, but there, but there's no there's nothing on the other side that says what if I'm wrong? How do you what do you buy? Do you realize, stock nerds and market lovers, do you realize that the Fed that that that, that prices and equities are being walked down in lockstep with the severity of the tightening? Do you realize we've never had this much tightening? Well, Alan Greenspan raised a whole percentage point in 1994. He didn't subtract gazillions off of a bed balance sheet and tighten. Folks, this isn't done. You're going to have some really great bounces in between, but this isn't done. And so don't guess. Which then leads me into, well, Tim, I don't trade equities like you guys. I've got a 401k. What do I do? Because my guy, who's just a salesperson from Edward Bull next to the vape shop.com. Oh, start over. What do you do? And for that, we introduce Daniel, 401k expert. Well, first of all, the one thing I wanted to point out when you were mentioning all these guys, yeah. where were these guys warning you that, hey, the market's weakening the markets months ago right. when the market started selling off, where are they are, why are they not saying get defensive? So now the narrative changed because the market's already sold off. Right. You, if you just bought and hold, now you're down 25% or so, right? Yes. Or 30 if you got more growth stocks. And now they're trying to form the marketing narrative on CNBC and, off, you know, Bloomberg on where we are now in space and time. They say, oh, now load up the truck and buy. What are you going to load up the truck and buy with? You wrote it all down. You never raised 50 or 80% cash to buy back in from a lower bottom and do your compounding from a higher base. So yeah. it's all about the marketing. It's, okay. it's all about the market. I want to make Danny's point because there are just – as Danny prepares to uh, uh, sermon here, Zach, show my screen. I mean that nicely. Like, no, you're going to educate here. This is these 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 moves in markets. We were at thirty seven eleven, um, at nine central. Mm -hmm. We we jutted down to thirty six sixty nine. These are not normal moves, folks. I have got on the futures a five minute chart up. The five minute average true range right now, or the, oh, that's the volume. I think the average true range is even greater than 25 right now. I don't want to waste time pulling up the chart. These aren't normal moves, and they lead to this kind of FOMO, and then you're caught on the wrong side, and your 401k is left. Your 401k is out in a battlefield with no flak jacket, no weapon, no helmet, nothing. Standing up. Standing up. <laughs> you're not in the trench. You're standing up waving. And, and investors are left to the Ron Barons and the Michael Saylors with white flags going, I surrender. But it doesn't have to be that way. Take it away, Dan. All right. Well, so I've been getting a lot of uh, uh, people reaching out and asking me because they're scared now. They watch their 401k. And here's the problem. The 401k is your second biggest n asset normally, pot of money, 
beside your house. And in some people, especially people that are, you know, more seasoned, a little bit older, and they're closer to retirement, their 401k might be bigger than their house. So it's either your first or second biggest asset. And you're always told, oh, to buy and hold, to stay the course. This is for your long term, right? And, and, you know, the buy and hold, yeah, maybe if you're right at the end of a bear market or coming out of a bear market and you're in a primary uptrend where you're just starting a new leg up that's going to be sustainable for a while, then maybe buy and hold works out well. But we're kind of on the other end, well, maybe halfway through it now. We're on a different time frame. And the older you are, the more important it is to have a sell strategy. So, so here are a couple of things that people don't realize with these 401ks. Okay. The first question, you, so you need to manage it just like your, you know, people distinguish, they separate their 401k from IRA, individual or joint account. Your pure brokerage accounts that they can be, they think they can be a little bit more active or, or, or be more proactive. And the 401ks have been told, we're going to slap your hand if you make any adjustments. You need to pick this target 2040 fund or target 30 fund or just get a pie chart of diversified assets that all go down together when you enter a bear market. <clears throat> Diversification doesn't help, but you're in it for the long haul. Okay. That's the story people have been told. Now, the first question, so we disagree with that vehemently. We manage a lot of people's 401k, outside 401ks, and we help them move. And you have to use a little bit different strategies based on the 401k because it's not standardized like an IRA where you can own individual stocks, ETFs. Every 401k is different. Okay. And by the way, if your employer allows it, you could actually own individual stocks in a 401k. You could even own physical real estate and precious metals. People don't do that. But the point is, the first question you need to ask is, first of all, if you're over 65, if you're 65 or over and you're still working, you can do a mandatory statutory rollover. It's called an in-service IRA rollover into an IRA. You can still make the contributions to your 401k, right? But you can, so say you got half a million in that 401k, you can roll that out and do individual stocks. You can buy short selling ETF. You can do whatever you want, long, short, whatever. Whereas, and, and then continue contributing to your 401k. So that's the first question you need to ask. Because if you're 65, you can, you can have it better managed. Number two, if your some plans allow for in-service rollover earlier. Some plans allow for it at 60 or 59 and a half or 62. I've actually seen one plan that actually allowed it at 52, which is, that makes me think the owner of the company was 52 and wanted to do his own thing. But point being is the first question you need to ask is, can I do an in-service rollover? Am I old enough? And does my plan allow it? And at 65, they have to allow it. So you can do more active management. Now, if the answer is no, I can't do, I'm not old enough, or I'm not 65, my company doesn't allow it earlier. Do you have what's called self-directed brokerage? That's a generic term. Fidelity calls it um, brokerage link. Uh, uh, Charles Schwab is PCRA. They're just different names. But that means you can have a little side account where you can transfer. It could be 70% of the assets, and you got to keep 30 in their 12 mutual funds that they pre-selected for you to do. Or it could be 100%. It could be 90 10. You don't know what the ratio is, but you need to find out because if you're allowed, now they may not offer this, but if they do, you can do either a portion or all of it in self-directed brokerage where you can do stocks or ETFs or whatever. Okay. So those are the, t in order, those are the two best options. Now, if the answer to both of those is no, then what are my investment choices and restrictions? So I've got a whole plethora of mutual funds they've chosen anywhere from 12 to could be 80 or 100. What are the best funds in there based on fees, expense ratio, managers, what have you? And then do they have any restrictions? Some will have a short-term redemption fee, meaning you buy this fund, we're going to charge you 2% of your original purchase price if you sell within 60 days because we want you to buy and hold. We're going to slap your hand. If you try to 
and this isn't day trading. This you're still going to get the end of the day average price, but so that's one restriction. So you gotta gotta be confident that hey, we're using a little bit longer term charts. We're going to try to make it through that sixty days. A second thing they can do is they can say a blackout period. If you buy, the, if you sell this fund, you can't rebuy this fund within thirty days or sixty days or whatever. So they they're trying to put speed bumps in there to slow you down. Now, if you've got the blackout period where you can't go back into the same fund within 60 days well there's more than one way to skin a cat you can rotate the funds they'll have two or three large cap funds and you can rotate those funds if it hasn't been 60 days yet so the point being is each 401k is different with different nuances you've got to understand your 401k it's up to you because it's your money like you said it's your money and if you're not going to watch it who is and this is one of the biggest assets that you probably have. So you need to be proactive and you need to do this. And look, buy, we don't agree with this buy and hold approach where you write it down 25, 30%, and then you got, it takes you years to get that back. All the gains from last year, from the market last year that people made, if they were just indexing, those are all gone now. Those have evaporated based on the market action this year. So now you've given it all back. So you need to be proactive. Now, you might not be able to be quite as active as in an IRA or a, or a joint account, but there are ways to to manage 401ks and limit your drawdown exposure. There's um, so my friend from uh, from IBD, I would like to talk to, uh, he, he messaged me and he said, where are the robo-advisors? What happened to you them? You can't hear them now. Yeah, the crickets, right? Because they wrote right? it down. Yeah, they, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. They wrote it. They wrote all of this down and which um, by the way our trademark robo texan so we have mm -hmm. a strategy for smaller accounts yeah. and we kind of base the 401ks the mutual fund only 401ks on this so ours is the only to my knowledge is the only robo advisor kind of model with the cell discipline so right. every slice of that pie whether it's bonds large cap stocks yeah, whatever exactly. have a cell discipline so you could be in cash, which it's it's almost all in cash right now. Don can talk about it in a minute, but but that's the whole point. And so, listen, stock nerds, market lovers, we 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 know who our audience is. It, 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 it's you, and you most for the most part, you're active uh, in the market. We know though that um, you trust us with your loved ones and friends, and look, they're the ones. Uh, you're probably um, if you watch our content. Uh, we think you're similar to what we're doing. And then we understand, too, that when you send our content to people who aren't following the markets, it's a hard it, – it, our content is a, a tough sell. And so, um, look, we know that you're going – and I'll explain why in a moment. But when you talk to your loved ones, your, your family, your, your parents, with their 401Ks, look, you don't have to do the heavy lifting. We, there's no sales cycle, as you know here. If they have questions – about how they can protect their, their 401k against this inflation scourge and a down market, which every week seems to get a little worse. Uh, look, what you do is you can email um, right there, uh, America's Fiduciary, Dan Stewart right here, dan at regressit.com, or if you're on a connected device, just call us. If by, by emailing us or reaching out on Twitter, however you contact or calling, you're, there's no spam emails. As you know, our content is just accessible. We do that on purpose. We don't advertise. I, I don't, not that advertising is evil, but everything we do is word of mouth. And that is a trust factor that, quite frankly, you can't buy through advertising. And that trust factor is huge. Now, why is our content a tough pill to swallow? It's the same reason, like I, I, I cut my teeth on Investor's Business Daily, which I think is the greatest newspaper ever, right? But it's not the most popular newspaper. Like in, inside the pages of that paper are the secrets to wealth, right? But it was, it, it took, it's not, it's too easy to say it took work. It took counter programming to what you've been taught and what the Ron Barons and the Michael Sailors of the world do. And um, when someone gets introduced to our content, I say it takes about a month of watching the five videos a week where we do, like oh, the five videos a week are nothing but charts, right? They, I mean, it's our voices telling you factually, like, like, hey, this is what happened. This is how you interpret this chart. We call it Tomorrow's Insight. And so, um, and, then we, and then on the podcast, we come in long. 
we love it when you introduce new people to our content, but we understand it's a heavy lift. But if you have loved ones with 401ks that are just getting decimated this year, right now you're at the lowest level in the markets, I believe, from December 2020. So now you've given, like you said, you've given back all 2021, and now we're, we're working on 2020. The year, right? The year of the big year. So um, it's never too late. So it's a phone call or it's an email. But look, the markets are closed Monday. Uh, call this weekend. Uh, talk, you, we'll, we'll, we'll give you how to approach you know, that discussion with your loved ones or friends. Or just have them reach out to us directly and we can absolutely uh, help in any way possible. We're here to empower individuals. And with that, was that all you had to say, Dan? Well, I do want to mention one more thing before I forget. I'm sure Don will bring it up, and I just didn't want to forget. So Don did an interview. I'm going to do that yesterday. Okay. Yeah. No, I, you okay. got to let a pro do that. Okay. I was about. To, I was going to. I was. Danny, do you have anything? I just more? wanted to make sure the pro didn't forget. The pro, pro. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. <sighs> Old paranoid Stewart over here. <laughs> So um, as I throw it to the other fellas, this is how transitions work, Daniel. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Hey, you didn't forget that thing we talked about, did you? No, I didn't. Sure. I didn't. I didn't forget Conway oh Twitty. So, um, can we get Con what does Conway Twitty look like? A lot of people on this thumbnail. Oh, it's <laughs> going to be pretty good, right? <laughs> so, pretty, pretty, pretty full. Um, so Dan, I think so. Don did uh, an interview, a process interview, uh, um, with uh, Richard uh, Moglin. Uh, how do you pronou pronounce his name, Dan? Uh, Don Moglin. Moglin. With Richard Moglin uh, yesterday. And so what we're going to do is, uh, I'll let Don expand upon it, but what we're going to do uh, for all our subscribers is on Monday, since there's not going to be market data, we're going to send out that interview that Don did on Monday. Uh, if I get it early enough I'll, on Sunday, I'll probably get it out Monday morning sometime. And so look for that. So there'll actually be, again, we do six days of content a week, uh, three, you know, 365 days a year. And so um, look for that Monday, Don's interview. But I'm going to uh, flip it to... Uh, Don, what, just cover what's in that interview real quick, please. Yeah, let, let me. Uh, Richard is uh, one of the founders of Trader Lion. They're they're very big on education, uh, much like we are. And he interviews traders. He's got a very uh, strong following on FinTwit. Uh, great guy. He has. Uh, he's a. He's also an O'Neill disciple. Understands the importance of preserving capital the way we do. And um, he reached out to me, asked if I was interested in doing an interview. And we talked a lot about uh, our, our process, how we've refined our process and uh, reviewed the, the criticality of the 200 day moving average, which we preach all the time that that's really where market risk picks up. It's not necessarily the risk that's with the individual, the way the typical uh, Wall Street advisors will manage things, but it's market risk, which is something that Danny is uh, always always preaching about. Uh, it's about uh, a little less than an hour and a half long. Uh, we talk about charts, we talk about process, we talk about influences. Um, had a had a great time doing it, and uh, Richard is uh, he puts out a lot of good content. He's a great follow follow on Twitter at Richard Moglen M O G L E N. A comment right. about that blood in the streets that we brought up before. I'm stealing oh. this from somebody that I saw from Twitter, but you don't buy when there's blood in the streets. You buy when somebody has a plan to clean up the blood that's in the streets. There you go. So wait until wait until the the the, the blood stops flowing. And uh, somebody's cleaning it up, and uh, that's the optimal time to uh, to uh, get back in. In other words, don't don't we talk about not trying to catch a falling knife? Because sometimes that falling knife will land in the top of your foot. That is uh, a good uh, guidepost. And again, moving averages are what we use. Moving averages, uh, horizontal supports, trend lines. There are signs that the market puts off when it's exhausted, both to the upside and to the downside. We talk about them in our videos five nights a week in our podcast, uh, and I talk about it in this interview. But um, the 200-day moving average is really the key between a healthy market and an unhealthy market. And just following that one simple rule would save people so much medical, mental and uh, financial capital that... Um, it just makes for a smoother ride, a smoother financial ride. And like I always say, it's 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 really a common sense approach. What other aspect of your life, when things are wrong, 
do you not take an active approach to fix it? Um, when I was, when I was explaining somebody who we, we just, a friend of mine who we just discussed, they're leaving, uh, Ray J, they're leaving their pie chart advisor that had no solution to them except to try to scare them that they, they got out of the market. They wouldn't know how to get back into the market. And, uh, the analogy I use to him is when he talks to her, he's talking to the car salesman. The car salesman only has one pitch. It's always a great time to buy a car. When you're working with us, we're the service department. We're the ones that have the tools to decode what, why that service engine soon light is coming on on your dashboard. And um, we explain it every day in our videos. And if anybody ever has any questions about it, they can always reach out to us. We're the most uh, open, uh, conflict-free, and um, customer-centric advisor that you'll find out there. You know, funny you say about conflict-free. I was explaining 12v1 fees to Tanya like two days ago. She's like, that's allowed. <laughs> Maybe not for long. They're really yeah. going after it yeah, now, they, but still. They yeah. uh, 12B1 yeah. fees yeah. are kickback money disguised as marketing. They're marketing fees, Tim. Yeah. They're marketing Danny fees, fees for using our well. funds. Right. I'll tell you what, let's keep Don going, then we'll go, we'll go Hunter last. We'll just reverse the order. Uh, Don, uh, 21, it's Friday, so it's uh, 21 over 21, or is it 21 under 21, or is it bury the dead? What do you got? It's uh, about uh, 3,000 under the 21 and one above. The only survivor <laughs> from, the, from the list two weeks ago is Zoom, ZM. Isn't uh, that is ironic? Under the, yeah. yeah, under the 200-day moving average, but their last earnings report was very well received. They've been showing relative strength since then. Uh, stocks stopped going down at some point. This one looks like it stopped going down for the moment. The fact that it's above the 21 when the market looks like it looks uh, speaks volumes about it. They're they're down to having a reasonable valuation, and they make money. Those are the two things that survivors of a bear market uh, need to show in order to have them being accumulated. Remember, you can't throw every tech stock out because the closet indexers have to maintain a certain percentage of tech in their portfolio because they're closet indexers. The the tech despite the fact that it's been decimated, still makes up by far the majority of uh, the percentage in the S&P 500 of the 11 sectors. And money has to flow somewhere and it normally flows in times of a bear market to reasonably valued tech companies. And Zoom's fitting that bill right now. Awesome. We don't own it, but as I said, it's on the 21 or 21 list. It has been for uh, for three weeks since we started cobbling it back together when we bottomed last time. And uh, it's the only one of the survivors off of the 21 list. Now, listen, if you want to uh, find another Don one that's looking good, I do want to mention one other stock, Ollie, O L L I. Uh, they're going to, um, they're, people are shopping inexpensively these days in times of a trying economy. And Ollie's actually breaking out of a decent looking cup and handle. Uh, back above its 200-day moving average. Uh, not the best numbers, but uh, their forward guidance was pretty well, and they still make money. Uh, never went negative on money. They've been profitable since 2016, reasonable PE, and uh, these are the types of charts that we're looking for. Who are the survivors that are still uh, considered to be a growth story, and when the market writes itself, uh, we would expect money to flow into these. Awesome. And then to find Don's work, um, revereasset.com, uh, just tomorrow's insights tab, mistakenly right there. And then just click tomorrow's insights and Don's video will be the top one here. It'll replace that one up until they fall shift down. If you want to do research on us, we don't print glossy brochures with people in suits that make us look really handsome. Some of us are handsome naturally. Some of us need brochures. They all work at Fitch. Now, you can you can shop us. How you shop us is you go to the Tomorrow's Insight tab and you just scroll down. Every video we've ever done since 2014 is here. Since March of 2014, you can find all of our work. And you just pick a time frame and you see how we handled it. Because that is a record. There is no one at any of these uh, strip mall advisors that can do that. They can just point to a chart of the S&P 500, but they can't tell you what they did or specific actions, because they don't document. We're documentarians. We're documenting everything that we do. We're like the police. 
every step you take, every move you make. Well, I don't think that's a great song for the analogy. But anyway, you get what I'm saying. I'll be watching. I don't think it worked. Does it work? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't not work. Not completely. Not no, really. No, no. It kind of no. fell apart there when I realized well, it's I documented it's just all. It's just all yeah. index stuff. It's just all the same stuff it's, as it's, with the it, index it, stuff. Yeah, same mutual funds that we've got kickbacks for. And you, by the way, that 12B1 fee thing is a real big deal. Uh, 12B1 fees are kickbacks. Like when you're in, if you have an advisor, your parents do, your friends do. Uh, the mutual funds that you, they were placed in, you need to call the advisor and ask them what 12B1 fees they're receiving from those specific funds because you'll be shocked to find out that they got a commission up front and maybe a trailing fee on the back side. Ongoing, yeah. Yeah, quarter after quarter, year after year. And when that becomes delight, people get pretty upset because it wasn't disclosed. And you should always, 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 always disclose the conflicts of interest because you might have questions. Yeah, or it's disclosed very poorly. Well, yeah, yeah. disclosed poorly is the same as telling a lie, right? Like you didn't, just because no, most people don't even know what a 12B1 fee is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, why would you even think to look at the, the, the finite price? Here's the bottom line. So with the mutual funds, you've probably got three or four share classes for each one. Yeah. And, quote, the best interest line is, is it suitable for you? They can put you in the most expensive share class as long as it meets your, quote, risk parameters. You really, what you want, if you're going to use mutual, which we don't use mutual funds except when we have to for 401ks, but if you're going to use mutual funds, you want the institutional share class. That's going to be the cheapest share class. It's also going to be the one the advisor gets the least paid on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what did that person, Don, what did the person say when uh, we, they, they took us, so, someone, a stock nerd wrote to us, they took us up on our advice to go find what the 12B1 fees were to their advisor, and the guy said, I have to eat too. What was the quote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they said, don't, don't I deserve to get paid? That's right. Well, sure you do, but not by uh, pitching overpriced products to me there there are cheaper products and uh, your fee should be from assets under management and advice that you give me not because you sold me something that makes you money frustrating okay hunter we have six minutes and 32 seconds give Just me the, exactly give... what i need yes <laughs> <laughs> all right so here's here's what it's going to look like i got a, a handful of tickers here that actually are showing some relative strength look decent Uh, There's not much out of there. So we're going to run through those, but there's a caveat that I want to talk about. And then we're going to look at two sector ETFs. So we're going to move through it quickly here, Tim. So NNST, Monster Energy Drinks, uh, a name that has been showing some nice relative strength really for the last several months. Uh, You can see it's not making new year to date lows like the S&P 500 and the Qs and small caps and so on have been in the recent uh, couple of days here. MNST hanging out at the kind of confluence of all of those key moving averages, the 50, the 21, the 8, uh, the 200 day. They're all kind of right there coming to a head on MNST. And it's actually got an RS line blue dot today uh, in MarketSmith, if you just so happen to check that out. So MNST showing strength. Another name, Don Stole Ollie from me, but another one, LLY, uh, that is Eli Lilly. This one actually held up pretty well amidst the recent pullback uh, and is running back up into that 300 level. But again, there's not much out there that looks great. A lot of what does look pretty decent is stuff that's more defensive or stuff that's gotten to an incredibly cheap valuation like Don mentioned earlier. But here's Eli Lilly trying to get back above its moving averages. Looks so far that it's been rejected, but the RS line continues to climb at a nice upward angle here on Lilly. And then lastly, we got the food products uh, acting pretty well. Pull up SAFM, Sanderson Farms. Tim. This is a company that, yep, they process fresh frozen chicken and other food products. Uh, but this looks the inverse of the market, as you can see, and a, a base that it actually has broken out of. And that's kind of correspondent with what we see in the, in the food world. Tim, if you'll pull up corn, um, you can pull up WEAT. Uh, these food-related commodity slash funds or ETFs, they actually look pretty attractive. They, they're holding moving averages. Uh, they're holding up much better than the market and so on. So corn, wheat, soybeans. Don has mentioned PDBC, which is a commodity fund uh, that has some of that in there. 
these are pretty constructive looking charts for the most part. Obviously, uh, some of these pulling back today, PDPC, uh, but they were strong yesterday. And so the point here is there's not a whole lot out there that looks great. And what I want to point out here on these food commodity, Sanderson Farms and those types of things that are, they look good right now. Oil stocks looked good about a week ago. Uh, Tim, will you pull up DVN or CVX, whatever you want to pull up. Uh, and these have absolutely fallen off a cliff and in a much more pronounced way than the actual commodity crude oil itself has. So crude oil is down to around the 110-ish area today. I believe that's where it was when I looked a few moments ago, 110, 111. Uh, but that's only off of recent highs around the 125-ish area. Uh, so uh, roughly a 10% pullback for the actual commodity itself. But you've seen uh, names like DVN, if you pull that up for me, Tim, that went from 80 to 57 today in a matter of about a week and a half. I mean, these are nasty, nasty pullbacks that these names have not really seen in the midst of their big bull run that they've had over the last year, year and a half or two. Uh, so some big moving averages being broke in the oil world, support trend lines being tested and broke in the oil world, and a major decoupling from the actual commodity itself. So if you thought oil was safe and it had acted very well relative to the market up until the last week or two, uh, certainly anywhere, <laughs> there is no area of the market that is not subject to the claws of the bear. Okay. So there's some other names too that you can look at. Pull up PWR, Tim. This is a name that actually looked really strong prior to this recent sell-off, uh, was holding up and showing great strength. And you can see from 138 just about two weeks ago to a low of around 110, 115-ish uh, area uh, here today. So still a sharp 20% pullback in a name that was one of the strongest looking names in the market. Pull up ON. This was a name that we owned. Well, Hunter, Hunter, uh, hang on, Hunter. You keep saying yeah. pullback. Those are all bear markets. Those are all bear. Well, that's not a pullback. That's a slaughter. Those are all bear markets. I guess I'm just using pullback because I'm talking about the last two weeks and yeah. how some of these names. Have all right. Been Swift so badly. slaughter, Swift bear market. There you go. Swift slaughter. <laughs> so the, the point here is, is although I just showed you, you know, Monster Energy, Eli Lilly, they're holding up well. So were a lot of these names up until two weeks ago, and they're, they're now down 20, 25 percent in a matter of two weeks. So that leads me to my next point, Tim. Will you pull up XLB? This is the. Uh, X or S and P materials fund. And what I want to point out here is there is a major loss of support in a sector that was trying to hold up and show relative strength. And so that major level is roughly the 78 to 80 level. And you can see it pretty clearly there on Tim's screen. It's kind of the lows of from back in July and August of last year into September, the lows of this year in January, February, and then even in April slash May. And then recently over the last six or seven trading days has gone from 85 to 75 and just absolutely blown through that support level falling off a cliff so the reason i bring this up is materials are an important component of the economy and so are transport so tim will you pull up iyt and what i want to talk about is the fact that this continues to make new lows here uh not showing relative strength at all on in the case of iyt making a new low for the year again today and this had a similar type of scenario um, that the materials has just gone through, but it actually occurred back in the beginning of April and then into May. So that big level for the transports was roughly this 240 to 245 level. It bounced in there a number of times over the course of the prior nine months or so. And then around May, it just broke down, has not been able to get back up above that level and has continued to make new lows. So what I want to point out is these are huge losses of support for these sector ETFs. Uh, sector ETFs that are pertinent to the economy, and they look pretty terrible right now. But I do one caveat here on IYT. It's right now, it's this 270, or excuse me, this 200 area uh, is right about the highs from 2017 to 2019, which was a, a long basing period for the transport. So uh, just something to keep in mind, it's right towards the highs from 27 to 2019, or 2017 to 2019, which just goes to show you the type of decline uh, that this ETF has had over the course of the last month and a half or two, really, it really started getting nasty right around the uh, beginning of April there. So I don't know if I was in my six minute and 32 second time. Dude, maybe I went nailed over. it, nailed it, nailed it. <laughs> now, Danny, 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 limited fake Don, or limited fake Danny did a great job of closing out the show, but nobody can do it like you. So Thank you. Because of time constraints, because Danny has a meeting, do the short one. Don't do the long one. 
do the short one because I got one last thing. Folks, listen, if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor, just send them to revereasset.com and they can sign up for our daily market insight. There's a subscribe button and this podcast will be delivered in their inbox as it's done. And uh, the daily market insights will also be uh, sent right into their inbox. We won't spam them or reach out to them in any way. It's up to them to reach out to us if they want a complimentary portfolio review, just have some questions or a topic that they would like discussed on the show. You can reach out to any of us at dan at revereasset.com, Tim, Don, or Hunter at revereasset.com. And you can always call us old school at 855-REAL-WEALTH. Real quick, uh, new weekly segment, uh, is inflation peaking? Okay, and Hunter was talking about the, Hunter was talking about the transports uh, coming off dramatically. And, and by, it could be deflationary, right? It could be a slow, like, demand destruction, right? It, are, are prices done going higher? I don't know quite yet, but I want to look at a couple things here. Talked about this last week. RBOB is down again. These are the gasoline futures, right? I've noted there's a varying degree of, uh, I track, everyone tracks gas prices. But uh, 20 cents differential, they started to come off uh, at a couple places Mm -hmm. uh, where I drive by every day. And so um, this has been a pretty, this, look at this. This has been now, since we talked on last Friday, it's just been a week of decline, uh, which Hunter was alluding to with, Crude oil, and so, um, and then we'll look at we'll look at a hot here in a minute. It, our pork price is coming down, so it's uh, HG. Uh, oh, that's copper. You know what? I forget what lean hog is actually. I thought I could do it off the top of my head because I thought it was HG, but meat prices are starting to come yeah, yeah. off a little yeah. bit. And so, well, you know, what? copper is interesting. You know, when co- when Doctor Copper is leading, it's expansionary, right? Yep. The copper is not leading. Well, they're 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 killing demand. I mean, they're taking care of inflation, killing yeah. demand. And so that's I think those are the things you want to look at. Uh, lumber uh, LB, counting your LBs. Lumber is uh, has come down um, since, especially since last year. And so these are a futures chart, two forty six to two nineteen last year. This fell off of a cliff essentially. So we'll see if you start seeing um, significant decreases. If you start seeing significant. I think it's I think it's bad. What's happening with oil, I believe, is bad for the markets. Oil was holding up the market. Okay, it's good for the consumer. Don't 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 misunderstand me here. But if this is the one sector that's been holding up the markets and it goes, you need someone else to do the heavy lifting. And Don said, not all tech stocks are evil, so maybe there'll be some kind of rotation. That's why you need to sell this. It is going to be hot time. And th- summer this is hedge funds liquidating. They pile into the hot yep. sector, push it up, and then they pile out when they're, they they made their profits, and it's not easy anymore. Yeah, things move so fast. They uh, the the saying, ah, "Let's give it one more day." That can really come back to haunt. All right, folks, listen. Have a great and safe three day holiday weekend, and we'll talk to you next week on your money. Did Don forget? No. Barring any extrogenous Ah, event. Wow, just a dramatic pause. (laughs)